want to read another story from the collection Else Fine, Little Tales of Horror from Libraries and Bookshops. This story is entitled Words. They're just words. Times Picayune Want Ad. Books for sale. Over 400,000 old books stored in three warehouses. Best offer takes them all. 15 Chupatula Street. 555-0199. As a used book dealer, I read the one ads every day, looking for tag sales, church bazaars, charity book sales, private book sales, anywhere I can shake loose some fresh stock for my store. But I'd never seen anything quite like this ad. 400,000 books? It had to be a typo. But it did mention three warehouses, so it could be true. I picked up the phone, prepared to be told that the ad should have read 4,000 books or 400. Still, it was a lot of books. I waited anxiously as the phone rang 10, 12, 15 times, and just before I hung up, a winded voice answered, Prunier's residence. Uh, do you have an ad in today's paper for some books for sale? Yeah. You're the first guy to call. Do you really have 400,000 books, or is that a typo? <laughs> I really don't know how many books are here. I just took the number of shelves and figured maybe 50 books per. There's way over 8,000 shelves and another couple of rooms of about 3,000 unsorted boxes. It's really quite insane. Are you interested? Well, it does sound a little crazy. Is this a library shutting down? No, they're all from my dad's collection. He has been collecting for over 50 years. Anatole Prunier. You must have heard of him if you're in the used book business here in New Orleans. Ah, uh, sure, I've seen him at some book sales. Can I come over now and take a look around? Absolutely. I'll meet you in an hour at the door to the warehouse. Fifteen Chupatulas. <laughs> yeah, I knew who Anatole Prunier was. Only the biggest bibliomaniac who ever lived. The guy was first in line at every book sale and he was the last to leave, usually buying whatever was left at the end. I'd seen him at the Salvation Army, leaving with shopping carts full of books. He came into my store nearly every day and left with at least 20 books. He nearly paid my rent for 15 years, but he was like a plague. When a tag sale was advertised in the paper, he would call the homes and beg to come early. He'd usually clean things out the night before I pulled up at 6 a.m. He was always trying to sneak into book sales early. He even went so far as to hide the night before at the biggest book sale of the year at the public library. He pretended to be a volunteer helping to sort books, and when it came time to close, he slipped under one of the tables and slept there all night so he could be first in the morning. He spent the night hiding books in the bathroom and under the staircase. When I reported him to one of the ladies running the sale, she just said, He's paying for everything. What's the problem? The money all goes to charity. Now hurry along and buy some yourself. He did have deep pockets, and he never worked at anything other than buying books. His father had owned half of Storyville, and when it was shut down after, the World War, after World War I, he had taken over most of the other houses in the surrounding parish. Anatole was an only child, and even after his father's death, he continued to receive cash payments every Monday morning from his father's lawyer. From some old-timers who knew the family, I learned that Anatole hated his family, and that he retreated into a world of reading and book collecting to run away from the rough criminal life that surrounded him. His collecting became more and more obsessive as he grew older. After his wife died and his children moved out, his collecting became truly monomaniacal. A doctor who had made a house call mentioned finding books everywhere in the house. Even the oven and bathtub were overflowing with books. There simply was nowhere to walk or move. Prunier slept on the fire escape for weeks since he couldn't get into the house anymore. That's when he began buying old warehouses south of Canal and filling them, too. When he had bought everything in New Orleans, he traveled to England after World War II and tried to buy everything there, too. Then he hired agents to keep the books coming after he returned home. His two sons left the old man to his bibliomania as long as they got their cash in the mail every week. But when the gravy train stopped, they made a beeline for New Orleans and to their father's house. From the time the sons got there, he had been reduced to simply sitting with a blank stare while he muttered over and over. They're words. Just, just words. He had developed what appeared to be Alzheimer's or some kind of dementia, and they were going to have to move him into a home. From his son Felix, the one that answered the phone, I learned that the two sons were all who were left of the family, 
Neither of them gave a damn about the collection. It was all just so much pulp as far as they were concerned. They'd grown to hate everything about books, from long weekends, driving around the country, being left in the car while their dad bought more books. Felix said he was trying to get on the NASCAR circuit, and he was in a hurry to get back to Daytona. He told me that his brother worked in a gambling casino in New Jersey that he had got into through some family contacts. Felix said that when the cash from his dad stopped coming in, they called the family lawyer. They were horrified to hear that Anatole had sold off all of his properties in order to continue his orgy of book buying. The sons were hoping that the money from the sale would pay off some of their gambling debts and bankroll a new race car for Felix. They were hoping to get millions, but they couldn't figure out why anybody in their right mind would want this stuff. The old man's muttering in the background only proved to them that books were a waste of time. Well, so how much are they worth, was the first thing Felix asked me after I had been in the warehouse for about five minutes. Uh, I, I've only had time to scan the shelves. I, I would need days to get a feel for what's here. Do people really pay good money for this stuff? He asked with a slack jaw. The old man sure did. That's got to be some other wackos out there, he pi piped up Lewis, the other son. I'll have to have some time. I probably can't even afford this. I'll, I'll get you an appraisal and you can, you can put them up for auction. We don't want to wait. We want the money now. Uh, I could talk to some of the heavy hitters in New York and see what I can put together. Give me the catalog your dad put together and I'll try to see what kind of dollars we're talking about. I'll get back to you in two days. We don't get hit with that hurricane. As I went to leave, the old man grabbed my hand and blurted, they're only words. They're only words. Yeah, we know Pops, snarled Lewis. It was sad to see the old war host so demented. He couldn't even get out of his chair anymore. Two days later, I called back and went over to 15 Chupatulas. I'd gotten the go-ahead from a syndicate of auctioneers to offer $2 million for the collection. That worked out to about $4 a book, a real bargain for the syndicate. They were lusting after a collection that was legendary in the book trade. Anatole had spent wildly at New York auctions through his agents there, and even though none of the syndicate knew him personally, they did know that he had bought only the choicest items. After I faxed a portion of the massive catalog, the syndicate called and said they would agree to buy it sight unseen. A collection of this magnitude hadn't come on the market in decades. They would fly down after the storm to deliver the check. As I walked over to the warehouse, the wind was whipping up, but it appeared that New Orleans had dodged the big one again. When I entered the warehouse, the old man stopped me and started his litany. They're words! They're only words! Well, he was gone, so he needed to get some professional attention real soon. Felix was happy to hear that I had been able to put together the, the syndicate's offer. But before I left, I wanted to look at some of the books that I had only had time to scan with a flashlight from behind piles of boxes. I wanted to collate a few of the better pieces. Just from reading the cataloging, looking at the bindings, I was sure that this was going to be a landmark sale. The syndicate was making out like bandits. Sure, there was lots of junk, but that could be sold off or donated to the library for their book sale. It was too dark to really see much of the collection, so I asked the brothers to open up some of the iron hatches on the windows. As they pushed the heavy storm shutters open, I reached for the Shakespeare folio dated 1623 on the spine. There were two others, just like it, sitting on the shelf. My hands trembled as I opened this holy grail of all bibliophiles. The light from the open windows had cut into the murky darkness, and I could make out what appeared to be shreds of paper falling like snow onto the floor. The weight and heft of the massive tome had turned to air in my grasp. The entire contents were like confetti blowing in the breeze. The binding was intact and beautiful, but that was all that remained. I reached for the other folios, and they too opened up a confetti storm of paper as the wind kicked up from the open windows. I frantically picked up a handful of the chaff, and I was struck with the realization that all the pieces were black. The white paper around each word had been chewed away, leaving only a single word and wind. The termites! The world's most ravenous termites had gotten to the collection. New Orleans was home to a strain of termites that could devour a whole house in a day. They could consume a living oak tree. They were slowly eating the whole city. In Anatole's brick warehouses, they had devoured only the paper in the books the ink being poisonous to them. Volume after volume liquefied at my touch. The wind from the storm was picking up the word chaff and spinning it madly about the open windows and into the street. The two sons were struggling to close the shutters and swearing at me like it was somehow my fault. They'd never as much as opened one of their father's books. Anatole began screaming again. They're words. They're only words. They're words. Now it made sense. 
He had gone mad when it had dawned on him that his whole collection had become nothing but a mass of pulp. As the gathering wind forced open even more windows, Anatole jumped up from his chair and began chasing the whirling words, trying to cram them into his pockets, chanting, They're mine! They're mine! as he plunged out the third-floor window, grasping at the words.